He was a soldier since he was 14 years old, a French Canadian in the British Army and a disciplinarian so fierce, his brother-in-law transferred to a different regiment. Now, Charles de Salaberry must take a few British regulars, some untrained militia, and First Nations allies, and stop an overwhelming 4,000 American troops from taking Lower Canada. If he fails, Canada is lost. If he succeeds, he becomes a legend. When you have a small force, you must make a lot of noise. The Americans are ready. Based on my experience in Europe, they'll approach along the Chateau Gay River. They'll have barely three weeks to prepare. It's the fall of 1813. The war against the United States is going badly for Britain. Upper Canada's capital at York has been attacked. The British have lost control of Lake Erie and have been driven from the Detroit frontier. And the United States are about to launch their largest offensive of the war. Their goal, if everything went perfectly, would be to eject the British from North America. Everything rests upon our defense of Montreal. If the Americans defeat us there, our supply lines will be cut. Upper and Lower Canada will be lost. The American plan is to attack Montreal and Lower Canada, now Quebec, in two waves. First, 7,000 men will travel northeast on the St. Lawrence from Lake Ontario. Then, 4,000 men will drive north from Plattsburgh, New York, along the Shadow Gay River. If they succeed, Upper and Lower Canada will be cut off from each other. My men and I have fought raids in this area. I know exactly where we should take position. Governor General Sir George Prevost is in charge of British forces in North America. He's been preparing for a possible attack for several years, despite the stunning lack of trained soldiers. We are desperate for men, but Prevost knows he'll get no help from Britain, not while Napoleon threatens the empire. With the British Army committed to the war in Europe, Prevost has been recruiting volunteer militia across Upper and Lower Canada. In some areas, convincing men to sign up is difficult. But in Lower Canada, he has the perfect man for the job. A French-Canadian who is also a senior officer in the British Army, Charles Michel de Salaberry. At the risk of seeming arrogant, I am the obvious choice for this assignment. Being Canadian myself, I can more easily convince others to join the fight. The British absolutely needed French Canadians to fight the Americans in the War of 1812. First of all, French Canadians were the majority of the time in Canada, so they were needed for supplies, to gather intelligence, and of course, to fight. De Salaberry has another advantage over other officers. He had worked closely with a German officer who was in British service, Major General Sir Francis de Rottenberg, who was a leading proponent of light infantry, which was a different mode of fighting. In 1813, most battles were fought with the troops lined up shoulder to shoulder in close ranks. Muskets were inaccurate, so tightly packed soldiers fired in unified volleys. The idea was if we mass everybody together and volley uh, our fire towards them, we'll hit something. Light infantry uh, was the opposite of that, and that was designed uh, as a tool to harass the enemy, to fight through close terrain because these large formations couldn't move through the wood line. So it isn't someone who waits in line, who waits to hear orders. He must go ahead, take the initiative, be capable of hiding, of keeping watch and attacking very quickly. My light infantry tactics are perfectly suited to this place. 
When it comes to moving through the bush, harassing the enemy, there's nothing better. The previous year, Prevost and DeSalaberry recruited men for a light infantry unit that could use these tactics in Lower Canada. We will need officers who will be able to endure the mental and physical distresses associated with this type of war. Light infantry must often bivouac, sleep outside, march for long days and even long weeks, march and chase the enemy, trying to find them, following their tracks. De Salaberry had been a light infantry officer since he was 16 years old. This light infantry was called the Voltageur Canadien. They must be effective to play a key role in Canada's defense. But first, De Salaberry must make farmers into soldiers. I need time, muskets, uniforms, drill. All of this takes time, and time is in short supply. The Americans are coming. I have every kind of troublemaker, wastrels, drunks, deserters, but I will have my way. In the 1800s, militias had a bad reputation. They weren't issued uniforms, they got little training, and they lacked discipline. De Salaberry wants his voltageur to be different. Being disciplined under fire is extremely important. On the other hand, they must be able to hide. To fire salvos, yes, but to do it in small groups. De Salaberry drives his men hard. His discipline becomes legendary. His own brother-in-law, a captain, transfers to another regiment because he finds De Salaberry too demanding. His drive for professionalism was too much for some people. My men are willing, but they are unused to following orders. I'm not certain which group is more difficult. The Irish? The Scots? The Germans or my own Canadians. The men composed a song that described Salaberry. And what the men were singing about their commander was not very flattering. The song says that there's nothing harder than being under the command of Salaberry. And that this devil was going to kill them. De Salaberry is also famous for his temper. His nickname is Gunpowder. It's true, I have a temper. Once, some fool in my regiment boasted that he'd killed a Canadian, like me, in a duel. I stood up and said, Well, now is your chance to fight another. The fight was not easy. He managed to cut me. I cut him back. Some say I nearly cut him in half. This is an exaggeration. But in the end, I did prevail. It is the fall of 1813. De Salaberry commands 300 Voltageur. They are now tough, well-trained, experts at moving through the Canadian bush. More men will join the fight. The local militia provides some, the British Army a handful more. More than 100 Mohawk warriors from the Kahnawake Nation have been recruited, too. But the Americans outnumber his troops by far, and they are on the move. September 25th, 1813. My dear father, the province is in great danger. Scouts have spotted the Americans gathering at the border, 40 miles from where I write these lines. Two armies are now converging on Montreal. Everybody's worst dream was happening. Within just a few days, the Salaberry scouts spot Hampton's troops at the town of Four Corners in New York State. 
I have traveled through this area. I know where I want the Americans to go. De Salaberry sets up a series of defenses designed to funnel the enemy to a specific location. One side is protected by the waters of the Shadowgay River. The other borders a swampy forest that's difficult for troops to cross. He realized that with the Americans advancing that way, if he used that terrain, which had a gentle slope immediately in front of the position that he occupied, it would be what we call in the military a killing zone. Here, this is the ideal spot to watch the enemies advance with maximum protection. We can dig trenches and cut down trees to make abati. Then, all we need to do is wait. He brought in over a hundred French Canadian loggers who cut down trees to create a line of fire and give them a clear view of the advancing enemy. The trees were piled together to make many abatis to prevent the Americans from getting through. And so the American troops wouldn't be able to see the defenders behind the trees. I shall also use our language to our advantage. I ordered my men to speak French. Hence, if we are overheard in the heat of the battle, the enemy will not be able to understand us. On October 25th, the Americans arrive. De Salaberry is ready. The American general, Wade Hampton, knows his enemy is out there, but has no sense of its size. He sends a thousand men across the river with orders to try to circle around and attack De Salaberry from the rear. The battle will be fought on both sides of the river. I know I can win if I use the terrain to my advantage. I know every turn in the river. The Americans only have maps, and not very good ones. The Americans' progress was very difficult. Men who were sent out on reconnaissance came back and told their commander it was impossible. It was too dark. They would get lost. It wasn't worth it. De Salaberry's forces opened fire on the Americans, then vanished back into the woods, luring the enemy toward the Abati. The terrain at the battleground forces the Americans to attack in a narrow column. The men at the back can't reach the fighting at the front, and many of the troops are confused. But they still outnumber the Canadians, and the battle has just begun. October 26th, 1813. An American invasion force 4,000 strong is marching up the Shadowgay River to Montreal. Charles de Salaberry is determined to stop them. So far, the Abbotee are working just as I had hoped, but I have another idea. De Salaberry knows he is outnumbered, so he uses a series of bluffs. I'll order my buglers to sound in advance on both sides of the river. I want the enemy to think I have a massive army hidden in the bush. Bluff is great in war because war is a physical act between two forces, but it's a psychological act as well. It's like a boxing match, a hockey match, any sporting competition, except the, the stakes are a bit higher. De Salaberry's strategy works. Thinking a large attack is imminent, the Americans hesitate. According to legend, this becomes a defining moment for de Salaberry. From my position, I can see both sides of the river. I watch as a column of Americans advance right into our sights. They send a single rider up to demand surrender. An American cavalryman approached before the Americans fired a shot and said to the Canadians, gentlemen, we mean you no harm. He appeals to the Canadians, speaking their language, saying, maybe you want to just give up. We're here to liberate you. And de Salaberry takes a soldier's musket and shoots him. So that, 
that's his reply. So the battle's on. He was the enemy. I saw no reason to hesitate, so I fired. The fact that the Salaberry shot first showed that he and the British truly had a fierce and aggressive mentality. With battle underway, the Salaberry's plan unfolds. Legend has it that he was standing on the tall stump of a felled tree, surveying what was happening in front of him and on the opposite bank with his spyglass and aiming heavy fire on the advancing troops. There are about 200 men on the main abatis, firing on a column of more than 1,000 men. Our light infantry tactics proved to be even more effective than I had dared to hope. We're protected by the abatis, and the American musket fire is passing right over our heads. Our native allies are also most effective. Despite their small numbers, the Indians' war cries sound terrible to the Americans. Natives did not fight in line. It was completely anathema to their methodology of warfare. De Salaberry would see a similarity in the way they fight, and that would help them work together because they're basically speaking the same language tactically. The main attack, which is coming against De Salaberry's position in very short order, it takes casualties and it can't advance. There is no room to maneuver to get around the position. The fighting lasts just four hours. The American general, Wade Hampton, withdraws his troops from the battle. He decides to return to the United States. Thanks to de Salaberry's training and cunning, half the threat facing Montreal is now gone. October 26 has been a glorious day. The battle only lasted four hours. But already, General Hampton and the American army have been driven back by my little band of soldiers, all of them Canadian. The Battle of Chateauguay is particular in that it is really a victory for the colonials the French Canadians, not the regulars. This victory should be entirely attributed to Charles Michel de Salaberry and his militia. The victory is crucial, but the invasion isn't over yet. There are still 7,000 Americans sailing down the St. Lawrence towards Montreal, but Chateau Gay has paved the way to victory. Montreal is saved from the south. This is a significant boost to the morale of the civilian personnel, but also to the military leaders, because they know that threat's eliminated. The second American army meets the British just 95 miles from Montreal at Chrysler's farm. This time, Lower Canada's Voltageur combined with the light infantry militia from Upper Canada, British regulars, and Mohawk warriors. The Americans outnumber the British two to one, but the Americans are poorly trained. Their musket volleys are uncoordinated and have little effect. The Americans are also very low on supplies and starving. The battle is short. The Americans withdraw quickly and move into winter quarters in New York State. Excellent news. Both invasion forces have been defeated. And I do not think I'm boasting when I say that my victory helped make it possible. In the aftermath of the battle, de Salaberry waits for glory. He knows future promotions depend on it. He is soon disappointed. After the Battle of Chateau Gay, Charles Michel was infuriated when he learned that General Prevost did not give an accurate report, in that he took credit for the action without even mentioning Charles Michel de Salaberry's name. The greater part of the merit is being taken away from me. I'm the one who set up the defenses. I alone took the initiative. None of the superior officers arrived until after the action was over. In an attempt to right the wrong, one of de Salaberry's men writes an eyewitness account to the Quebec Mercury. 
In fact, it's likely that Prevost did intend to give de Salaberry credit for the victory. He even issues a second report elaborating de Salaberry's role. But for de Salaberry, it's too little too late. Chambly, November 12th, 1813. Dear O'Sullivan, you have rendered me that justice which is still denied me at headquarters and which I no longer expect. He finally rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in 1814 after chasing it for almost 10 years. But it was very hard won, and he was bitter about that too. He was unhappy that the British Crown did not recognize Charles Michel de Salaberry's full worth. In 1815, Lieutenant Colonel Charles de Salaberry resigns his commission. I'm hurt, and I've had enough with war. I was never given the credit I deserved. I've decided to leave the army, get married, and start a business in Quebec City. But the recognition de Salaberry craves does come in his lifetime. De Salaberry eventually receives one of the British Army's highest awards, the gold medal, in recognition of his role at the Battle of the Shadow Gay. He's also made a companion of the Order of Bath. Perhaps the greatest honor comes from the troops he pushed so hard. My voltigeur never doubted my role. They gave me a beautiful silver platter to commemorate our victory. What makes this unique is that the tactical commander is the Canadian leader who made an influence on the war unlike any other. The ultimate honor is victory. And this war will have brought us the ultimate reward, Canada.